Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Tim. I am an iOS engineer at Twitch here in San Francisco. And today I'll be talking about how to use and create property wrappers. So as a quick overview, I'll be talking about um, what property wrappers are, where to use them. And then finally, I will go over how to create your own and show some code examples and some implementations. So before we dive in, I thought I'd give a little history about property wrappers. So they were first proposed in 2015 as property behaviors, basically as a way to allow patterns like lazy and NS copying without adding language or compiler complexity. Ultimately, that proposal was rejected because it was too early to accept and because the community was not clear on design and the language itself still was changing. It being 2015, I think, um, yeah, Lyft was probably one of the first ones that used that in production. Um, so, the proposal came back in March of 2019, and um, first calling this pattern property delegates, but after some review and revisions, it was accepted under the name property wrappers, and it shipped with Swift 5.1 this summer. And also throughout the summer, the implementation details already changed a little bit. So what you might have seen in the slides at DubDub might not all be valid anymore. So I guess there's also a disclaimer that if anything changes in the future, my slides might be out of date as well. So what are property wrappers? Essentially, they are at prefix property attributes. Uh, this is in line with the semantic that class attributes and function attributes use. They describe policy behind data access. Um, which allows us to access higher level behavior that was previously only reserved for language features. Um, they help us to document the property semantics at the point of definition and enable us to write our management code once and then reuse it by applying it to multiple properties. And honestly, property wrappers can be anything you want them to be. Just need some imagination. So before I move on to talk about where to use them, I wanted to give some um, like where not to use them examples uh, or some gotchas. So property wrappers can only be applied um, to vars, which means that they cannot be applied to let properties. However, you could have a constant property wrapper. So that means that the actually the implementation of the property wrapper determines if a value is mutable or not compared to other values where the user defining the property can make that decision. Um, so basically, all properties that use a constant property wrapper are immutable, and all the ones that use one that is you know, mutable will be that way. Also, property wrappers cannot throw. That means if you want to do operations within your property wrapper um, that can throw, you have to handle them right there since you can't make a property throwable, right? Otherwise, how would you access it? Um, also, you can't not use them with uh, local properties, at least not yet. So we're constrained to the top level of our classes, structs, or enums. Furthermore, you don't have access to the property owner within the wrapper. So that means if you rely on a view controller for your property stuff, um, you won't be able to access that owning view controller in your wrapper. Also, you can't annotate keys within collections. However, you can annotate the whole collection if you wanted to and if your implementation permits that. Um, this next one, you're actually able to combine multiple property wrappers, but you really shouldn't because the order within the chain matters. And often you run into concurrency issues because property wrappers define the set and get behaviors of our properties. So if we do that in order or not in order, we might end up with um, results that we're not expecting. So if you have a use case where you want to combine two property wrappers or the functions of two property wrappers, I suggest that you create a single wrapper that can handle your use case. Also, if you are in a mixed code base, you will not be able to use these properties in Objective-C. So I guess it's a good thing we're at a Swift meetup, right? So where can you actually, or where are some good examples to use property wrappers? Um, you should use them when you want to separate your property storage from your property definition. Um, you should use them when you want to constrain values. So for example, if you want to set a min and a max, 
Um, you should also use them when you want to transform values on property assignment. So uh, an example of this could be maybe we want to trim some white space. Um, it can help us to reduce boilerplate code. For example, if you have properties that depend on a certain operating system version, you could use that. They allow us to add missing functionality without changing or extending the type meaning this way we can influence a specific instance of that type instead of all instances of that type, which extensions do. And they can act as the man in the middle for data access. This could be, for example, really useful for persistent value storage. So enough text, let's look at some code. Um, these are some property examples. Um, so there are already some built-in frameworks that make good use of them. First and probably most notable, we have SwiftUI which defines a at state property wrapper that allows the view to observe a value and update when the value does. Combine also exposes a at published wrapper, which allows the defined property to become a publisher and transmit a sequence of values over time. Uh, but to explain what properties can be, I also have some examples of custom property wrappers. So for example, we could define a property wrapper for user defaults. This one um, takes two parameters and could be used to store and read from standard user defaults and also provide a default value if you haven't stored anything in user defaults yet. We could define something that clamps a value. So in this case, we have um, an RGB color value and we're clamping it between zero and 255. We could define something for um, trimming. So here we're applying this to a string and it will automatically trim any white space around the username. We could have something called rounded that is defined for a price here and would always round the price to two decimal places. Dynamic UI color, where we pass in a color for light and a color for dark, and then when we access it, it will be returned based on the user interface style could have an expirable property that takes a duration and will return nil once the value expired. This could be really useful for tokens, for example. We could also have a lazy constant wrapper that initializes once the value is needed, just like lazy does, but with the added thing that it forbids reassignment, so it actually becomes a constant. Or we could even have a wrapper that applies continuous corners to the layer of a view. As you can see, there's many, many use cases. Um, just kind of have to come up with them. So next, I want to look at how to create your own property wrapper. This is basically the bare bone implementation that you will need. Um, you can start with defining a struct and apply the add property wrapper um, attribute here. Then next, the name of the struct will become the property wrapper name. And we can either define a specific type or use a template type. Important is the wrap value here, which is the property that you'll be wrapping. And um, within that, we define our custom get and set behavior. And then finally, also an initializer. In this case, it only takes the wrap value, but it could also take other parameters that we need for our implementation. So let's look at the implementation of the trimmed property wrapper. So we use an underlying value for our get and for our set. We constrain this wrapper to only work with string types. And on setting our wrap value, we do some transformation where we trim white space and new line characters in this case. Here's the implementation for dynamic UI color. Um, here we take two parameters, a color for light and a color for dark, which is then stored within the wrapper. On retrieving the wrap value, we actually use a computed value here. We first check for iOS 13, then we check for the user interface style. This way, it also allows us to fall back. So if we are using um, this on an older operating systems, we will simply get the light color back. Or if your app uses custom theming, you could also implement your custom theme in here and return the color based on that. This is what uh, clamping looks like. And here we're using a template type and um, make sure that that type conforms to the comparable protocol. So this means we could 
use this with other types than just numbers, right? So we could maybe use this with a date or some other custom type that we define that implements comparable. We do the transformation on setting our value, and then we use a little helper function, which you can see on the right here, to determine the new value. So if it's out of bounds, we simply set it to the min or to the max. This is what the implementation for user defaults looks like. Um, we take a string key, so two parameters again, string key and then a default value, which is the same type as the wrap value. And then this is a good example of um, where the wrapper is actually not responsible for storing the wrap value. So we use the underlying user defaults, in this case the standard user defaults, to get and set the value. And this works great with the Boolean that we defined up there to check if dark mode is enabled. And if it is not present, meaning it hasn't been set yet, we simply return the default value on retrieving. But however, if we want to use this with a custom type, like our user struct in this case, um, we'll run into the following issue. Xcode will tell us that we attempt to set a non-property list object as a user default value. And that is because both the wrapper and also the user default set method take any type which isn't good because um, we don't want to have this runtime issue where we can't store the type that we're trying to store. So how about we only allow types that actually are able to be stored in there? So looking at the documentation, we can see that strings, numbers, dictionaries, dates, URLs, and some other types are able to be stored in property list and therefore in user defaults. So how about we tell our wrapper to only take um, types that conform to user defaults type. Now that is a protocol that doesn't exist in the language, right? So we could implement our own stub and then make all these types that actually are able to be stored in user defaults adhere to that. Could look something like this. Now this will limit to your wrapper to only work with those types that are actually able to be stored. Um, as you can see, you also have data, which is able to be stored in uh, user defaults. So if you really want to store your custom types, you could archive it to data and then store and retrieve it. And you could even do that in the property wrapper itself. Um, however, when you convert and then basically cast back or convert back uh, on retrieving, you might run into some issues and you have to take care of those right there in the property wrapper. So that's as a little um, heads up if you want to use that implementation. Um, text is lazy constant, and as I mentioned previously, all, prop, all wrap properties have to be defined as bars. Um, but this is an example of an implementation um, that could make the wrap value immutable. So here we only define a getter for our value, and if we try to reassign our property, we actually get a compile time error saying, hey, this is a get only property, and um, you can't not, cannot reassign this. Also, there is another tidbit. Um, this implementation actually currently doesn't work um, because there is a bug in Swift with the way that auto closures are handled. So in contrast to the actual lazy implementation, which will only execute the constructor once the value is called, um, here it will actually, the constructor will actually be called as soon as the auto closure is captured. Um, good news is there's already a PR with a fix open. Um, but it will hopefully ship soon. I checked this morning, it was still in review. So that's just <laughs> something to keep in mind if you want to um, use a property wrapper like that. Next, I want to introduce a, um, another concept which is a projected value within your property wrapper. So we see, uh, we've seen the wrap value defined within our property wrapper and in addition, we could also define a projected value which you can access through a dollar prefix and this is mainly to avoid collision with other variable names since you can't define your variables with a dollar at the start. Um, and projected values uh, can be used to expose even more functionality. You might have seen this concept in SwiftUI and Combine already where you often access your properties with a dollar sign. And there's basically two ways that you can use this. You can either um, make this the, a different type, meaning you can either make it the type of the property itself, or you could make this any other type, even like a custom type that you implemented, 
or the second option is you can um, expose an instance of the wrapper itself. Um, previously, the compiler would actually create this instance for you, but now it can be defined by the user and adds a little bit more flexibility because if you don't need an instance of the wrapper, why should the compiler generate that for you? Um, so to, to look a little bit better at this, I have some examples for this. So this is a property wrapper called formatted, um, which has a projected value of type string. Um, the property wrapper takes a date and the wrap value is actually untouched. So we can use with, you can use this date like you normally would, you know, can um, transform it, you can compare it, you can add time frames to it. There's no like constraining of the value, there's no transformation of the value. The interesting part about this property wrapper is that it implements the projected value. And when you access um, your property with the dollar sign, you actually get a string back, um, a formatted string. In this case, it's in ISO format. So this could be really useful when you're communicating with a server. Uh, but we could also use this for displaying the date in our UI, for example. Um, maybe you want to use a little bit more human-readable format for that. And then um, another example is uh, expirable. It takes in a time interval for the duration parameter. Um, and I kind of mentioned this previously, but basically it uses an underlying storage for the value, which is also attached to an expiration date. And then it will return nil once the expiration date is up. But we also have a projected value in this example. So in this example, we actually expose an instance of the wrapper itself, meaning all the public properties and all the public functions within the wrapper are then exposed through the dollar sign. So in this wrapper, we have something called is valid, which is used in the implementation to check if the date is still valid or not. And we can also access that from the outside. So we can say dollar sign property name dot is valid and could use that to determine if we need to request a new token in this example. And we could also use this to, we could use this like instance of a property wrapper. Um, so if I'm thinking about a, a database um, property wrapper where we could maybe add a delete function. So we could have a property wrapper for your database stuff. You could have get, set, and then also have a delete function, which is exposed through the instance of the property wrapper itself. Because um, if you access it without the dollar sign, it will tell you, hey, it's valid, doesn't exist on a string. And if you don't define a projected value, the dollar sign syntax will actually not work at all. So is that what the future of Swift will look like? Cluttered with at symbols and dollar signs everywhere. Uh, there's a tweet that kind of went viral this summer shortly after DubDub. I think this was like after one of the Swift UI sessions. Um, and I do believe this is a big step for the language. And it is a little bit of a paradigm shift, but I don't anticipate that every value is going to use a property wrapper or that most values are only going to be accessed through projected values. The whole reason for this pattern is that you can apply it to only specific properties, right? So I think Swift will still look familiar to us. Uh, just got some new powers on 5.1. So where to go from here? Um, I want to encourage each one of you to look at the code bases you're working with and maybe identify some places where you might be able to reduce some boilerplate code and use a property wrapper. An example of this, uh, at Twitch, we're now using a wrapper to access our experiment values that determine if a user is in an active or control group of a test. Uh, but I also say, encourage you to not stop there and think about how you could use this pattern to enable new functionality in your code base. And also the opportunity to improve safety and reduce code complexity is immense. And then finally, some resources to dive even deeper into this topic. Uh, you can read the proposal and see what the use cases were that were originally described. And the Swift docs also gave, uh, give a great overview and talk about the wrappers in the properties section. So before I close out, uh, I want to mention we are hiring at Twitch. So if you want to join our team and use and create some property wrappers, uh, you can go to link.twitch.tv slash iOS engineer. There you can find the job description. You can also apply. And if you want to reach out to me after today, I am at Tim Rosner on Twitter and GitHub. And I thank you all so much for your attention.
We have time for three questions. Raise your hand, and I'll come to you with a mic. So what kind of uh, considerations do you need to uh, have when testing both the property wrapper itself and adding property wrappers into code that you need to test? Yeah, so when adding the property wrappers, I think documentation is definitely one of the biggest concerns because if you're defining it um, for other developers to use, they have to know about projected values, they have to know about how their property is transformed and what's going on under the hood. And then when it comes to testing, you can um, define an instance of the wrapper itself. So you don't have to like always use a property. Um, so you can, for example, then access underlying storage, or you could even expose a projected value, right, and could test that projected value and see what's going on under the hood. Um, so unit tests, I think, is the best way to test your property wrappers for sure, because you have some expectations of what they should do. So if you're testing for transformation, you can do that. If you're testing for constrained values, you can also do that very easily with unit tests. Yeah. Uh, can I relate this with uh, annotations in Java? I'm actually not familiar with annotations in Java, um, so I don't know. <laughs> that would be the answer. Okay. No problem. Uh, so it needs to be defined with Swift 5.1, but can it be uh, executed before, on like before iOS 13? Yes, yeah, so you can use it before iOS 13. The only requirement is that your code base is using Swift 5.1. Yes. To take a very short stab at answering the Java annotations question, um, property delegates are actually a feature of Kotlin. Um, and that was part of the inspiration for this. Um, but also, you can use Java annotations if you have um, some code gen steps that ingest that and do code gen much in the same way that property wrappers sort of have a backing computation. Okay, give it up for Tim. <laughs>